Hi, everybody. I am Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader. And so actually the Fedora project leader doesn't have very many technical, like actual like um, constitutional responsibilities or roles in the project. Uh, mostly it's trying to convince people of things. But one of the official things is being the chair of the Fedora Council. And the Fedora Council, in turn, is the leadership body for the Fedora project. And in particular, um, we, we do have some governance responsibilities, delegating money and things like that. But mostly, the goal is to come up with and set the Fedora strategy for both long term, medium term, and short term, uh, based on you know community input, not just setting things top down. And then also help the project uh, um, actually you know execute on its strategy. So my job is organizing that mostly. That's that's the that's what I do. Um, I've been doing that for a while now, and normally I am um, over from my office part of the upstairs over there, but I'm having some problems with my laptop, which is, you know, um, happens to everybody, I guess, is what we're saying here. And so now we're seeing me working from my treadmill desk area and the messy background, which I had not prepared for having in the background, but there it is, different view of my life for this meeting. Uh, there. All right. Hi, my name is Marie Norden, and I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. Um, my main role is to help support and grow the community. So I am all over the project. I'm on the Mindshare Committee. I'm on the Council. I help with objectives. Um, I work with the Code of Conduct and incident reporting for the Code of Conduct. Um, and I'm just kind of generally all over to support and provide input on the council. Uh, Bipple. Hello, uh, I'm Bipple Siddharth. I, my pronouns are he, him. I'm the DEI advisor to the council. I mostly act as a DEI voice in the community. You would see me working around Federal Week of Diversity, Mentor Summit, surveys, and a few more things. Happy to be here. Akash. Hey folks, Sakash Steve here. My pronouns are he, him. I lead the Fedora website and apps team and represent the revamp objective in Fedora Council. Um, as my day job, I work in the community platform engineering team. Sumantra. Hey, I'm Sumantra. I work for the Fedora QA team. Other than that, I do a few other things. Uh, one of that includes revamping the community alongside Marie and Mariana. And um, I go around with test days some, sometime in Fedora, and I used to lead a lot of uh, outreach efforts in India plus Asia. And I used to do a lot of mentorship activities, including GSOC, until recently. That's me here. Yeah. All right, and I think I'm last, so I'm Ben Cotton. My pronouns are he, him. I am the Fedora program manager, which is sort of like the uh, chief cat herding officer for um, getting the release out every six months. Um, I will be your uh, dedicated moderator today, um, but since we only have one question in the Q&A so far, we'll have to do a lot of vamping. So please um, put questions in the Q&A so that we have things to talk about. Uh, to answer your questions, this is really a chance for the community to directly interrogate the council. Um, although we do welcome you to pop into the council channel on Element or um, into the council tag on Fedora discussion anytime. Um, there's just really not enough of those conversations happening. We'd like to see more of that. Um, so to start it off, how are you liking Nest so far? I'm enjoying it. I, I think um, I, I've i been having the problem of wanting to be at every session so far in two places. Um, even I often have that problem, but it's really strong this year. So I guess that's, that's good. We've got a good lineup. Uh, it's fun to see everybody. I do really wish we could be in person. Um, I, I like the, the, there's, the virtual connections are nice, but um, yeah, missing the in-person still. So hopefully next time. Likewise, you know, the talks have been going great. 
the only thing that I'm a bit sad about is time zone thing. It's a bit late in the day, but hopin.to, good platform. I can always catch back recordings and I don't really have to wait for them to get to YouTube. So yeah, even though I would like to be in these talks when those talks are happening, I can always catch them back later. Yeah, as we uh, were talking about in one of the other sessions, I think that um, time zones, like what, if we do get people all together, obviously it's harder and more expensive and a lot of more, uh, um, or work to get people from all around the world together but then we do get everybody all in one time zone and when you're you know working from when you're doing this from home um you're not going to shift to the time zone of the conference really so it's so that makes yeah. it really hard um whereas if we do it all in you know if we do it all in you know the us or we ha ha we, were, we were talking about doing flock in india um, before things shut down and uh, maybe we will still be able to do that um so uh We'll you know, try and bring people there as many people as can, um, and yeah, um, that that makes it you know, global. Um, and then, but obviously, also having the uh, you, know, by the, you can tell by the number of attendees, we have ten, you know five times as many people here as we would normally have at a flock conference. This also does make it available to more people. So I don't know how to get the good of both of those things. Um, without a lot more work. Um, but I don't know, maybe a lot more work ends up being the answer just for not for Marie, but for the next person. Yes, go uh, so up, sounds good. So we do have a couple of uh, more substantive questions. So if, unless, unless anyone else wants to jump in with nest comments, uh, we'll move on to those. Um, so the first question comes from Jerry who asks, what do you see as the biggest barrier for would-be new contributors to Fedora? I have a place to start, at least. Um, documentation, outdated documentation, scattered documentation. Um, you know, we use the wiki for a very long time and there's a lot of outdated wiki pages out there. I think that can be confusing for new contributors. Um, not quite sure where to go. I think also it can be, you know, depending on the personality or the person, it can be a bit intimidating to introduce yourself via mailing list or um, in a chat room. So, and uh, depending on who's in that chat room, it's not always a 100% fantastic interaction. And that is something that we take seriously and we try to work on if people have those types of not great interactions, you know, we're having conversations in order to improve that. But I think, you know, we've, I've talked to at least a couple people who haven't had like a hundred percent um, great interaction on their first introduction. So those are the two that come to my mind first. Yeah, I'll second both of those. And I think add another thing, which is sometimes uh, there's no one there. And then people, you know, there's not your interest in something. It's an area that clearly needs help, but nobody's around to help lead you into where that is. So either, either just nobody's there that day or week or moment. And then it's like the opportunities missed or just it's a group that uh, needs help so much help that it's not even running. This is part of uh, the whole flywheel theory. That's kind of one of our cent central organizing things about uh, how to keep a project running. And so we've got some areas that don't have a flywheel. So I think that's that's a problem as well. Um, yeah, and then I think maybe a little bit related to all that, um, there's uh, uh, not always easy fix, easy things to jump into on a lot of different areas. So it's hard to figure out what my, what the first contribution is, what the first step is. We don't have those paths built out for a lot of areas. And that's, that's a lot of work to do and a lot of work to maintain. Um, but I think that's probably something that projects that onboard people easily and successful have a lot of those waiting for people. And we, don't always and we do in some some areas like I think design team is a good example of places where there are some some of those there and, and it's easy to do onboarding but other other areas um, don't have that so much yeah and building on what you said um, you know, I think having more mentorship 
um, you know, both formally and informally in the project would help. The, uh, you know, the join SIG does a great job of helping people who come into the join SIG get situated and get going. Um, but we don't, it's not, the mentorship isn't evenly distributed across the project. And if we want to double the number of active contributors, that's something we're really going to need to scale up in order to be successful. Vipul, Sumatro, Akashdeep, any, anything you want to add here? No. Well, I'll one, piggyback uh, on Marie's point. Um, the thing that she mentioned about when people come into the community first, so they require some special attention at that point in time. Sure, they'll be able to catch up later, but when they're entering, they have so many things to look into, so many things to participate, and so many things to be a part of that it becomes overwhelming. And one-to-one -one mentorship in the long run can be tricky. We don't really have so many people and so much time, and we can't quite promise that. So yeah, mentorship, more efforts to that. And if we have a documentation right, that's the best thing that we can do. And we have been doing that. So absolutely 100% on all the points. Uh, one more thing is I, I look at retention of contributors as one of the biggest challenge after they're onboarded. And one of the ways that we solve that is try to reward as much as possible and not push contributors to burnout. So that is one of those things that probably mentorship, while we are mentoring somebody, can be instilled in them that if you feel burnt out at any point or you need help, you know, keep up, don't, don't just keep doing whatever you are doing for so long that you feel totally exhausted and then there is nobody to pick up after you. So that's that's one thing probably that should be talked about a lot and probably can help us um, figure out better ways we can manage the load between contributors and new folks who are coming. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Well, perfect, because Sumantro's answer leads into the next question. Uh, what do you think Fedora's greatest challenge is? so many challenges it's hard to pick um i i think uh adapting to change and doing big changes um while you know kind of keeping what we are is a ongoing theme of something that we have a hard time with um and you know computing world is always changing so that's that's a pretty big meta challenge i guess um i i definitely feel um under resourced, I guess, constantly, like not enough people to do the things I think um, we ought to be doing. And, you know, people often show up with great suggestions of what we should be doing. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. Um, so I, I don't know, I feel, I guess, uh, I don't know, it would be nice to have um, just, you know, a lot of people with a lot of free time to do whatever. And, you know, we don't have that in the world. So I guess that's kind of a challenge as a volunteer, you know, a project that mostly depends on volunteers who are passionate about that, making, you know, making easy space for those people to, to do things and making it exciting and fun and useful so that we can have a growing community. I guess that's a continually big thing. I would raise my hand, but there's no raise hand function. Um, to add to Matthew's point, um, it's not just the tech that's changing all the time. Also, the way that we have to do things through Mindshare, like um, supporting, providing resources to the community is kind of also constantly evolving. There's always new things that we have to consider. Um, you know, we're trying to, especially with COVID, um, people's safety, different policies that go into effect around Fedora's funding, and the quickness in which those things change, it's difficult for our community to adapt and to understand them as quick as they're actually happening. So I think that that can like, you know, disenfranchise people, disempower people sometimes when they're like, I thought I knew how to get this thing done. And now uh, I found out that it's a totally different process. And I don't know where to start. Um, I also think that burnout is one of the biggest challenges across, you know, Fedora, especially for the core contributors. 
And that's why one of the things that we want to focus on is mentorship. You know, like we were, I was chatting with Alexandra in this in the channel, like stop doing all of that work yourself and start teaching other people how to do it, right? Like it, this is something I've been doing with design for a long while. Like I don't have the time to do design and do all the designs in Fedora that I would like to see done. But instead, I've uh, interned, I think, or mentored four outreachy interns in the last couple years to do graphic design. Um, so, you know, I'm investing an hour or two a week in somebody else's, you know, growth, uh, skill development, and attachment to the Fedora community instead of trying to take on all of that design work myself. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to learn to do because, I mean, sometimes it's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't always pay off right away, right? And, and sometimes it sometimes it never pays off. You may spend your time, you know, maybe teaching, you know, four or five people you know, the things that you think would be useful for them, and then you know the return you get back into that isn't necessarily. It's not guaranteed that uh, that you're going to. Um, and I'm putting it, you know, in kind of crass economic terms, but like, um, you you doing that may benefit the people and not actually give you somebody to delegate to um, a lot of the time, which is also its own value, but makes it a really hard thing to do if, if what you're really feeling like is cramped for time and things. It's uh, hard to do that, even though I think you, it, it does pay off in that way too, but it, it makes it hard. Sometimes it just, uh, I'll just do it. I don't have time for, you know, getting other people up to speed on this. So figuring out how to make that easier for people and encourage that and make that a, a default practice is something we need to work on. You know, pig, uh, piggybacking on your point, Matthew, uh, retention of contributors, because uh, like Mary mentioned, that when you teach someone something, a certain stack, a certain design principle, something of that sort, we kind of uh, hope in the back of our minds that they'll stay back, contribute in the community, maybe do the mentorship like we did. It does not always happen, sadly. And uh, the mentorship forward thing is something that we would really like to see as something that we would want to make happen. But then again, not the easiest thing in the world to a challenge. I, uh, I don't know about challenges, but I have a few wishful thinking again. I like to think Fedora is in a good state, especially Fedora Linux has got a lot of good press and community also feels very attached to what we do. It will be great to have some community metrics to, along with our gut feeling of where community is going a bit better sustainability metrics to see our happiness and where we are going with things. Just to, again, it's metrics are just quantity when without insight into community, it's useless, but we have that. And pairing it with some numbers would help us make better decisions, I feel. So community metrics, more accessibility, I'm thankful. Thankfully, it's become one of our priorities to look into now. So. But we can always do more around documentation and accessibility and uh, more informed decisions. So these are some of the visual thinking that I have. I actually also want to add something over here. So the way I look at um, one of our major contributor bases, uh, anyone who is willing to develop a skill set learning what Linux is, somebody who is very new to Linux, doesn't know anything about Linux, wants to learn something. And in that, in that case, having uh, freshman year students uh, actually contribute to Fedora can actually benefit them uh, while they are there for four odd years in their college. And they can sustainably grow the community as well for like two, three, four years sticking around. So mentoring one of those segments can actually help us retain a lot of contributors. However, we, have, um, we don't have a clear program how to do that yet. But it would be really good to actually have some of that in our program where we can go out to colleges and um, you know speak to students and get them onboarded to Fedora in such a way that they stick around for four odd years. And in that way, we just don't get to double up our contributors, but we also get to retain these contributors for a longer period of time. And as a result, they can pass the pattern on to their juniors and so on. So that way, it's a revolving loop days back. I, I think for us, um, I see our biggest challenge as being uh, what Bex is talking about, you know, doing what we're doing 
and more of it and better. Um, you know, we are really good at doing things with North America and Europe right now. Um, we, as far as I know, have almost no contributor base in Africa. Um, you know, we have pockets in in uh, India and in part of East Asia, but you know, we're not nearly as geographically representative of the world population as we'd like to be. So, how do we, um, you know, grow those communities both just in number and in, um, you know, just in our reach and our ability to coordinate and work together when we are truly, you know globe spanning all of the time. How do we um, have more asynchronous work? I think we do a good job of it now, but we're going to have to do better in order to meet our goals. Um, which I didn't mean to do this, but uh, talking about working asynchronously, there, the next question is about synchronous communication. Are there any plans to have Matrix be the default mode of chat for the project? Think matrix bridge to IRC rather than IRC bridge to matrix. I'll answer that one. Um, I think that is the plan. Um, and I think, uh, honestly, I would like to get to the point where we're actually disconnecting some of the IRC channels because I think the bridging um, is uh, brings it down to um, the lower level and limits what you can actually do. And I think there's some pretty useful things that Matrix provides that we should be getting people to do. I know people are fond of IRC and it has some, there's some, there's some good things about it. And also we had our Matrix host down a little bit the last week, which was annoying, um, but it's not perfect, but there are some things, you know, just like I'm using you know, reactions um, rather than a lot of plus ones and things um, makes really for a nicer conversation. Uh, some of the things with polls and more advanced features, um, those are those are nice to have. Um, and I also think that yeah, the moderation is better. We can easily delete things. Uh, I think there's some good things there. Um, and we also have you know some IRC channels where some of that unfriendliness that Maureen was um, bringing up are just kind of the IRC cultural norm, and it gives us a chance to reset some of those norms. And with the bridge as it is. Um, you kind of have a, hey, this is our channel that's been this way for 20 years. Why are you coming in and telling us our channel should be different just because it's bridged? Well, if that's the case, then maybe unbridging ends up being the answer for some of those. Um, but I think the part of the problem right now is, uh, this is again, I want to send people to the, um, I mean, and maybe part of my problem is I'm trying to get this organized on a, as an asynchronous discussion on the discussion platform. There's a matrix tag there. Uh, and we don't really have a matrix admins group. We've got random people who help set it up. I am one of them. I would actually like to stop being a matrix admin because um, I, it's a lot of, um, I don't want to have to wake up at four in the morning to delete spam because there's nobody else around to do it. We need people all around the world um, who are interested in being on a matrix moderation and admin team and can take care of that. And we haven't really had people show up interested in doing that so that's a um, if you're interested in matrix um, find those threads in the discussion forum and honestly uh, take take over because I, I do not want to be in charge of it but I would like it to happen um, I, I actually want to dispute the premise of the question a little bit just in the sense that most of the time there really isn't uh, the project in terms of fedora you know it's really a collection of semi-autonomous you know, affiliated sub projects, um, and you know the council has explicitly decided over the years that you know teams should be able to use the platforms that work best for them. Um, so you know there was a lot of Telegram usage, and, um, especially before we had you know an official Matrix server available um, because it had the lower barrier to entry, and that's sort of where people were. Um, I don't think the council. Um, and I'm going to speak for all of us here based on previous discussions, but I don't think we really have much interest in trying to mandate to the entire you know, community, this is the tool. Um, I think we want it to be the default that people choose, but still have freedom to you know, defer, uh, to change from defaults um, when it makes sense for their community. Although we hope that um, those are rare cases. I think I'd like to add in one point here, which is 
different people find different chat platforms accessible or not. Um, and I know that's something we're focusing on, but the DEI team was just talking about this. And, you know, there was someone who's vocal on the team about Telegram being more accessible for them. So we put the bridge back up. And so now Matrix, Telegram, and IRC are all bridged again. So, I mean, I think there's the ideal way to do it, maybe in our minds, but then I think also thinking about who's actually using these and who wants to be on them and wanting to be accessible to more people. I don't have the solution for this. I really don't. But I, I do think that allowing teams to make the decision as individual teams makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge because of that problem of things being disconnected and where to go a little bit. There's definitely some appeal to saying, um, we've got this is our chat platform. Come here. Um, this is where you'll find things. This is our Git repository place. It is here. This is you know, like uh, centralizing things a little bit more. Um, can kind of help with that, like that confusion and sprawl about where to go and where to get help and where to talk, where to, talk to people is also a problem. Um, so yeah, it's a balance because I hear what you're saying about that as well. Um, and the bridging again, like the, the the Telegram bridge can also really be confusing as well because of the way it it, it happens to work, um, where people on Telegram may think that they're notifying people and they're actually not, and you uh, don't realize that you're not getting notified, and then you get it disconnects in people's expectations of what that meant. Um, so sometimes, and sometimes the bridges can tie things together, but they also require a little bit of extra understanding that you are working through a bridge. It can't it. Uh, if people think that it's invisible, but it actually has artifacts, then that can make the communication problem worse. Matthew, I'm going to ask you to refresh real quick. Your audio is apparently kind of uh, not great. Um, and we'll see if anyone else wants to contribute while Matthew is reloading. OK. Well, then while Matthew is refreshing, um, I will jump up to a question that um, I don't know that he would be the only person with input on. But um, this is going to make Marie cry. Do we have any roadmap for getting discourse totally onboarded? That's actually something that Matthew has been working on, um, thanks to him. Um, but yes, we are working on it. We are in process of bringing discourse on board. So as many of y'all heard us through the process of bringing Element on board, it took us a little bit over a year. So we are approaching that mark with discourse, but it's it's a complicated process because this is this means bringing a vendor onto Red Hat, right? So it's Fedora doesn't have an entity to bring vendors on. Um, so it means working through Red Hat's processes and, you know, kind of explaining our needs because they fall outside of Red Hat's maybe normal business, you know, standard business needs. There's quite a bit to navigate there. So um, Matthew and I are both working on bringing Discord on, or Discourse, excuse me, on board. And hoping that's happening within the next three to six months. All right. Anybody else want to throw in there? Is it better? For now. Um, so uh, kind of a little bit of a loaded question here, um, but I'll read the whole thing for context. Flat packs have many downsides compared to RPMs. For example, hugely increased storage footprint, memory usage and startup times, outdated bundled libraries, driver mismatch issues, and desktop integration. And then there's the commonplace displacement of the much advertised security sandbox, which means there's little or no gain at huge cost compared to RPMs. Why is Fedora still trying to push flat packs as the future of the software delivery mechanism? 
I wonder if that question is a little bit leading the witness or um, uh, ha has, th there are a lot of things in there which I think are very disputable. Um, there are, uh, in some cases, there's more storage usage, but since it uh, deduplicates things, it isn't necessarily the case. Um, startup time shouldn't generally be that much larger. Updates should be can be much smaller because if one tiny file changes, just that just that file can be updated. Uh, so there are a lot of things that can be advantages. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, duplicated libraries that that can happen. But on the other hand, that also solves some problems where uh, it isn't actually possible to have a unified library and have everything get along. It decouples things in a way that makes your system more flexible and usable. Uh, and I think that actually one of the reasons we should work on this in Fedora is the kind of default way to do it is basically everybody rolling their own and pushing it to FlatHub, maybe building on a FlatHub. Uh, whereas if we can actually do a really good job of generating flat packs in Fedora, we can bring some of the strengths that we have as a distribution of consistency of making it so that um, you know our standard libraries, our compiler flags that are security based, you know. Um, are, are all there and we can actually maybe bring some intelligence to making sure those updates and libraries in the ones that are under our control get updated. So if there's a security problem, we can identify which flat packs might need a particular update and handle that. So doing that in Fedora actually brings a benefit to people. Um, there was, I gotta say in the user survey, I, I didn't actually see the slide here about it, but um, there, there was a lot of um, comments in favor of, of Flatpak there as well. Although, um, yeah, I know people are skeptical of it. Um, I'm not sure I remember all of the objections there, but I think there's a lot of advantages. Uh, the other one was like the security sandbox. A lot of, so uh, to summarize that, basically Flatpaks can be wrapped like they're in a container. Um, but if they do that, uh, some of the applications expectations like don't work because it's like, expecting to access your whole home directory and suddenly it can't and it acts weird and that's confusing to users. Um, so a lot of applications are not really very strongly bubble wrapped, basically. They're not protected from the system or the system isn't protected from them, whichever way. Uh, so like, what are the advantages of the question? And I think part of this is um, what, uh, but there's there's a thing about building Linux distributions that one of the Debian people said a while ago, which was that to make a Linux distribution, you've got to be able to accept uh, tepid progress for the somewhat better. Like things don't have to be immediately uh, like, ah, this is solves our problems now. And so uh, in order to get to a place where we have nicely integrated applications that do have those protections, like something like Flatpak that does the decoupling is an important first step. Even it doesn't though it doesn't solve the problem, it gets us closer to that. And having that, so that's a that's a fundamental first step in getting there. Uh, yeah, um, there's a comment there. Flatpaks uh, make sense only on something like, like Silverblue. Um, I think that um, maybe is partly true, although um, I think there are things on a non uh, OS tree, non silver blue based system where it, there are some advantages as well. But yeah, um, I think it maybe does make the most advan most sense on something like silver blue. But I also think that that approach, silver blue, core OS, the Fedora IoT thing is a good way to go. So um, I think that can, those can, both can be true. Um, Anyone else want to offer input on this topic? We'll move on to the next question. Oh, I, I'd like to. Oh, I got Go ahead, Matthew. All right, so there, there's a comment here that uh, the runtime is duplicated with system libraries. Um, yeah, that, that can be a duplicate, um, duplicated. We can also do deduplication of that if that's an, an issue. But um, yeah, having a runtime that's duplicated is, it is more space. Um, that's true. Um, it's a thing, it's a cost that you pay in order to get the advantages. So one of the advantages that I thought of having flat packs in the first place is because it's a good middle ground. There are software libraries that don't quite keep up with the updates that we have in Fedora. Uh, first, as one of our foundations, so we, uh, you can pretty much expect that the dependencies that we maintain are very up to date. It does not happen to be the case for the softwares that we make use of a lot of times. 
So flat pack helps us reach the middle ground. You know, even with some older libraries which are still supported, might not be in the current distribution, but we can have it packaged inside of the flat pack. And that is how, uh, you know, the uh, slow times was something that was a case in 2020, according to the article. But I don't see, I uh, think it's the case right now, or at least not in my use case. All right, so we'll move on to uh, another question. Um, back to Ben's answer for the geographical user base challenge. How can we grow this? What about the idea of potential Fedora folks doing some type of volunteer mission in these places to help spread the awareness of Fedora locally while teaching the opportunities within open source and helping grow their knowledge or some type of collaboration with local organizations? I think you're going to talk about ambassadors, right? Yes. So eventually, so this was this problem was supposed to be solved by introducing this program called ambassadors and advocates. The advocates were these people who would not have any commitment to Fedora, but can go to any event under hundred dollars and then reimburse it from Fedora. And that can be either a install fest, a uh, a general awareness session, uh, you know, a day with Fedora Linux, something like very easy, non frictional people with a Windows laptop can step in, get a, you know, live boot Fedora, play around, learn, grow. That, that, that was the original idea behind that. Um, the Revang program is currently successful. So, one thing that happened with a lot of these geographical challenges as they happened, where we got embargoed with a lot of countries. So recently with the geopolitical scenarios, there were a bunch of places where we could not operate anymore. And that's because Red Hat couldn't operate anymore, right? So we had to go, go step down and say, these, are, these places just cannot support it. Um, as a result, you know, our contributor base pretty much declined. Uh, that's fine. But with the coming days, I think one of the key areas which we can focus on is basically getting the awareness up and running. And that requires us to have some efforts from the marketing team. And like Matthew mentioned, even if a lot of contributors would love to come and join marketing team, there should be somebody to show around the place. Um, it's like entering a new Airbnb. You still need directions to the place. You still need what what's happening and somebody to host you, right? And then that's that becomes one of those challenges that has always been um, something we try to solve. That, that's my input on. You know, apart from ambassadors, hat has been something that uh, was a bit too divided, sure. But we were able to connect with people who belong to those areas, you know, representatives from those places from India, from the places where these events took place. A lot of contributors, a lot of users who are not necessarily contributors, they came, they went uh, to attend these talks. They were a part of discussions as well. And when they left, they had this thing in their minds that, well, Fedora is something that they would want to be a part of. So, um, yeah. There are uh, a lot of things that we are doing towards it, and I'd like to see more of that happening down the line. Matthew, you look like you're about to answer. I'm trying to not be cynical. I guess I, uh, some, some of this feels like the um, great ideas, but not enough people to do it thing that I was lamenting a little while ago, because I yeah, I think it would be great for Fedora to have people volunteer in to do these things. Um, so yes, please. Uh, but um, and I actually, that's a little bit of flip. I think uh, this is something we identified as part of if uh, the, our strategy um, that we're going to build out. And so I think it is something we want to invest in as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's a good idea. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, where do you think we are on focusing about silver blue? 
I'm not entirely sure of the context of that question. I probably should have asked to follow up, but I think this is kind of a are we are we gonna make silver blue the default, which I kind of uh, said I would, I, I would like to go in that direction. I think part of it is um, it's not something that we've really put a huge investment into as a project. And this is again, you know, people showing up to do things. People are pretty excited about it. I think that if I look at the comments on the on the survey and just like see social media things, Reddit comments, like it is an outsized impact in enthusiasm and people in bringing people in, which is good. Um, I think we need to figure out how to turn those people into contributors, into helping build Silver Blue more. Uh, part of it also is, I don't think, um, honestly, this is you know peeling back the corporate things, uh, Red Hat for the Red Hat uh, RHEL workstation, which has a very different use case from the Fedora stuff, is not completely convinced that that's what something, something the customers want for what they're doing. Um, customers tend to be very, very conservative about how things work and would actually prefer everything to go back to uh, GNOME 2 and, you know, not ever change from that, please. Uh, so um, that means it, that, like, the desktop team at Red Hat it doesn't have like that it's a labor of love for everybody working on it i guess that's the that's the thing um so uh maybe maybe there'll be more investment there depending on where that where that goes at, at red hat but i think it's mostly really up to the people who are interested in the technology and think it's a good idea to work on it and i think that's that's where it will go in the meantime i think it is kind of like all of our different spins and offerings. We'll see where it's going and what energy it's picking up by itself. And we're not, um, and I don't think we're at the point where we wanna like push our fingers on the scale as the council um, yet and see what that is because uh, obviously the more traditional way of putting together an OS is working pretty well as well. And I don't wanna um, mess that up. All right, um, before I read out the next question, I realized maybe we should have explained a little bit um, how the council is structured, so I'll, I'll set the context. Um, so the council um, members are a mix of people who are hired by Red Hat to be in certain roles, which is Matthew, Marie, and me. Um, and we also have people who are selected to represent the uh, groups within the community. So the Engineering Steering Committee, the Mindshare Committee, and the diversity, equity, and inclusion team. We have our objective leads, um, which are people leading a uh, generally 12 to 18 month effort to do a larger um, you know, change, either technical or community related within, the, uh, within Fedora. And then we have two people who are elected by the uh, community directly to serve on the council for one year terms. And so the question was, uh, is there a minimum requirement to run for the council? And Sumantro had indicated that he had something to say, so I will let him go first. So one thing, uh, I have been running for elections for quite some time, uh, both Mindshare and council. So um, one thing I wanted to explicitly, I noticed this as a pattern and I wanted to explicitly talk about it, or at least bring it up, is when we write council interviews, for mostly people to read and consume before they vote, that's mostly in English. Now, we uh, are a very diverse community, which means a lot of our contributors also come from places which, where English is not probably the, the number one language of the most spoken language, right? So constructing a lot of huge, heavy sentences containing meanings, grammatically correct and syntactically right, putting that as a part of an election uh, interview, might become a challenge for a lot of contributors, which may, which has a resultant decline on how people have n never submitted interviews because they, they just thought it's a lot of work. Um, uh, plus, this is not my language, accepted only in English. So I wanted to really um, understand how the council feels about at least having a section of this thing in any language which is not English, making the, the community more cohesive about how they can submit a part of the their what they want to do to be in their language more be more comfortable rather than force them to write in a pattern where they are not. So um, 
I will say if it makes you feel any better, I don't think the interviews actually matter all that much. Um, just comparing like the number of votes cast to the to the page views on the interviews, um, I think it's pretty clear that a lot of election, um, just like in political and any other group elections, um, a lot of it comes down to name recognition. And you know, so you know, the best thing you can do to help your candidacy um, when you are running uh, for an elected position uh, in Fedora is to be active in the discussions and to not be a jerk. Um, you know, if, if people recognize your name and they rec kind of associate you with um, you know, thoughtful input, uh, that tends to correlate pretty well with um, you know how many votes people get. You know, I spend a lot of time just lurking in channels and on mailing lists. And so I kind of have a sense of who the active participants are. And I feel like I can generally guess at the relative rankings of elections based on that before the results actually come out. Um, to answer the question directly before we sort of sidestep into Sumatra's question, because I think it's a good one. Um, basically, the, the requirement is to have a Fedora account and um, currently to have um, signed the Fedora project contributor agreement. Um, there is some open discussion about whether or not that will continue or and in what sense. Uh, but other than that, uh, we welcome anyone to run. There's no, you know, must must be this tall to ride. Um, you'll have more success if you've been around a while and have established a name for yourself probably. But, um, you know, one of the ways that you can make yourself more well known is to put your ideas out there by, uh, you know, standing for election. So I'm, th I'm thinking about what Shimantro shared a little bit. Um, and yeah, um, I'm going to put the uh, English as a, as a language of Fedora aside for just a second and come back to it. So setting aside English, I do think the ability to write and communicate clearly um, is a essential ability for being on the council. I don't, um, I think that's, that is vital. So uh, again, come back to language, but just be, being able to write and do the interview and being comfortable with that, um, you should be able to do that. And uh, if people are not feeling comfortable with that, but are interested in leadership in the project, I think maybe some mentoring, like that's an area where mentoring in you know that kind of communication would actually be useful to help people feel comfortable in that way. Um, so I, I, I think like, um, even though, like Ben says, the um, maybe what you actually write isn't so important, I think be, being able to do it is is a good sign because um, that's what you'll actually need to do to participate in the project as well. Um, and then, yeah, the language, like English, like, so I, you know, I had some high school level German. Um, I couldn't, can't really put a complicated sentence together anymore. And uh, other than that, I, you know, I only speak English. Uh, so I'm coming from a very American place in, in that. Um, but, yeah, but I don't know, but's not the right, right conjunction here. Uh, there are a lot of languages in the world, and there are dozens of languages in Fedora, and we kind of need some unified way to talk and communicate. And so mostly for America centric reasons, you know, we've picked English as the language of the project in a lot of places, you know, it is kind of a language of the internet, um, again, very American centric, but, um, there is, there's, uh, English is, is a common language in the project. Um, and so that's, uh, where it is, I and I opened ideas for how we could make it more multilingual in a way that still um, makes us all able to communicate together. Um, you know, Star Trek translators would be nice, or we could all learn Esperanto um, to be all equally disadvantaged. Um, I yeah, I, I don't I don't know a good answer. I would like to not make it. I, I would like to make it so that being a fluent English speaker is not a requirement. But I also think that. Practically, it it really is right now. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know. I'm open to thoughts on that. So one thing, and I, we don't really have time to decide it now, but I, I think I'll action myself to start a discussion thread. Um, historically, I have done basically no editing other than formatting in election interviews. 
because I am very conscious of um, not wanting to, you know, be seen to, you know, put my thumb on the scale, as it were. Um, on the other hand, I happen to think I'm a fairly decent editor, and you know, as a native English speaker, I can often at least be like, "Hey, this sentence doesn't really quite, you know, English the way maybe you, you meant." Um, so, you know, that could be something that the council sort of decides, like, should, like, what sort of level of editorial, you know, should, you know, the program manager give when interviews are coming in? Should we stick with, you know, hey, does the formatting look correct and nothing else? Or, you know, should there be some involvement? Should we have other, you know, other people um, who, you know, have less official titles in the project be able, you know, come in and help people? Um, I think, you know, de there's definitely, you know, there's no, no prohibi prohibition against having somebody else say, you know, giving your answers to somebody else and say, hey, can you help me refine this? Um, and I, I would encourage it, you know, even for native, native English speakers, you know, do my ideas that I'm expressing make sense. Um, you know, find a friend and ask them, you know, even before you, you know, if stand up as a candidate, you know, look things over. Um, so, you know, maybe there's ways to tune the process a little bit. I'm going to add something right. uh, Alexandra Go said ahead. here um, that uh, English is kind of a language and technology um, that, uh, yeah, uh, I think you cannot go far without English in IT right now or anymore, and it is okay. Uh, we should expect simple English, though, not overloaded with idioms and cultural references. I think that's maybe something we can be sensitive about. I know uh, watching some of the Red Hat things over the years, um, as Red Hat grew into a global company, um, there's a tendency sometimes of business people to make metaphors involving baseball and American football, and sometimes those don't translate around the world. Um, so being careful about those things. Um, you know, sometimes those don't translate to me because I have no idea what that football reference was. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, like being careful about that is something we could be conscious about. I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah, and there was actually something also also so reading back here about um, making making me cringe. Uh, one of the one of the things I brought up on the discussion site because it has the ability to edit things um, on the Stack Exchange sites. Uh, there's a pretty strong um, culture of editing people's poor English into standard English or English that the person who's doing the editing liked better um, and you know, basically changing people's voice to be more of a uh, generic English voice, I guess. Um, and so we talked about, you know, should we do that on Ask Fedora, on Fedora discussions? We you know, fix people's errors and uh, pretty strong consensus that no, we should let people you know, speak as they're speaking and leave it to be their voice. Um, so I think that's I know, something. All right, I well, it is time for everyone's favorite event, the pub quiz. Oh yeah. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, thank everyone and Please continue to have conversations with the council in um, the council channel on uh, chat or in the council tag on Fedora discussion. And hopefully we'll see you all in the pub quiz.